Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to class. Today we are going to talk about Delheim's response to Chomskyan linguistic competence. And responding to Chomsky's idea of linguistic competence, Delheim's coined this term communicative competence in 1966. The speaking model where each letter of this word is speaking represents uh, an element of discourse. So, S P E A K I N G acronym, it is an acronym created by Dalhams. So, today we are going to talk about speaking model, what this model is all about. Uh, Delheim's coined this term communicative competence in response to Chomsky and linguistic competence that he proposed in his famous work Syntactic Theory, uh, Aspects of Syntactic Theories in 1965 and where he made a distinction between linguistic competence and linguistic performance. And uh, the Delheim's response is about the delinking of these two uh, aspects of language, linguistic competence and linguistic performance. Linguistic competence in Chomsky proposal is the underlying grammatical structure, a uh, structural representation in the human mind, which is tacit in nature, and uh, linguistic performance is affected by many, many. Uh, linguistic factors like uh, distraction, shift in interest, memory. So, he delinks these two levels and he considers linguistic competence to be the primary object of study of linguistic as a science. His delinking was uh, criticized by people like Halliday, people like Heim, General Himes, and in his response to Chomsky and linguistic competence, Delheims comes up with communicative competence. What he means by communicative competence is the language in use. So, he says that you know we do not only learn structures and in their abstractness, but we also simultaneously learn the use of it. A structure without a contextual use means nothing. So, he puts performance uh, at par with linguistic competence and he merges these two levels linguistic competence and linguistic performance into one composite unit and says that it is the communicative competence that we acquire and he does not delink these two levels. So, to counter Chomsky's abstract notion of competence, Dalheims explained ethnographic details of communicative competence that included communicative form and function in integral relation to each other. So, instead of delinking the two, he makes it or he argues for a composite union of it. And, uh, and in his detailed response, he develops ethnographic details of communication. And communicative competence is the intuitive functional knowledge and control of the, part, part, uh, of the principles of language usages. So, this is what is his response to Chomsky's communicative, uh, sorry, linguistic competence. So, Delheim's early work frames a project for ethnographic investigation into uh, contrasting patterns of language use 
across speech communities. Delheimt himself called his approach the ethnography of his speaking. The speaking in all capital letters acronym was developed as a method to aid field workers in their attempt to document and analyze instances of language use across communities. Delheims argues that in order to speak a language correctly, one needs not only to learn vocabulary and grammar, but also the context in which words are used. So, the whole idea of competence as proposed by Delheims takes into account the meaning and the context of use of it. So, we cannot delink the grammatical structure and the use or function of it. So, the form which is the structure and the function which is use, they, they both are clubbed and combined as a composite unit and Delheims argue for communicative competence. So, linguistic competence and communicative competence stand in opposition to each other, where communicative competence links the two labels competence and performance, Chomsky delinks competence and performance. So, this is a reply or a response to Chomsky's idea of competence. We have talked about uh, you know communicative competence in our earlier class. So, here we will talk about the ethnography of communication. He, it started with ethnography of speaking, then later to in to in uh, you know incorporate larger discourse elements, Delheims himself renames it and he calls it ethnography of communication. So he explains and incorporates sixteen components applied to, to, to discourse. And what are the sixteen components? These are message form message content, setting, scene, speaker and sender, addresser, hearer, receiver, audience, addressee, purpose that is outcomes, purposes that is goals, key, channels, forms of speech, norms of interaction, norms of interpretation and genres. So, this is this is uh, how the 16 components as mentioned by Delheims, they are clubbed into 8 and here we get the speaking model. So, the arrangement or the hierarchy of these elements have nothing to do with this acronym. This acronym has been created uh, irrespective of the of the sequencing and hierarchy. So, so the order of appearance in no way reflect any hierarchy ascribed to, assigned to, attributed to these elements. Uh, this is just for creating an acronym, a catchy acronym so that everyone can understand and uh, it connotes with the whole idea of communication. So, that is why we have a speaking S P E A K I N G. So, Himes argues that in order to speak language correctly, we will need to learn the form and the function together, they cannot be delinked. So, function cannot be delinked with the form, the structure and the use both are composite they cannot be delinked and they cannot be put into any hierarchy. So, he believes that both are acquired, learnt as a single unit. In this context, the learning the components of a speaking model is essential for competent, competence. So, what are these uh, you know acronyms that they stand for? 
if you look at this pictographic uh, representation, S stands for setting and scene. So, in speaking, S stands for setting and scene. P stands for participants. E stands for end. A stands for <coughs> act sequence. K stands for key. I stands for instrumentalities. N stands for norms and G stands for genre. So, these eight elements of discourse. So, 16 elements of discourse that we just talked about, uh, you know, and what are these? These are message form, message content, setting, scene, speaker or sender, addresser, hearer, receiver or audience, addresses, purposes that is outcomes and purposes as goals of communication, key, channels, forms of speech, norms of interaction, norms of interpretation and genre. The 16 elements clubbed into 8 and they were given an acronym speaking where S stands for setting and scenes, P stands for participants, E stands for ends, A stands for act sequences, K stands for key, I stands for instrumentalities, N stands for norms and G stands for genre. So, we will go to each of these uh, you know elements one by one. So, let us begin with number one setting and scene. So, setting and scene in speaking model refers to the time and place of a speech act and in general to the physical circumstances. Scene is the physical setting or cultural definition of a setting including characteristics such as a range of formality and sense of play or seriousness. Setting of the speech event also refers to location of participants and any physical barriers that may be present. So, it, it refers to the background in which the speech act takes place. So, that is the first element setting and scene. <coughs> the second uh, element P stands for participants. So, who are the participants in this speech act? So, speakers and audience, it refers to speaker and audience. A speaker and audience that can be distinguished as addresses and other hearers. When considering the participants in a speech event, one should consider implicit and explicit rule about who is speaking, who can speak, who should be involved, what expectations are established for the participants and who is speaking and who is being addressed. So, this P refers to participants in the speech event, one who speaks and the other who receives, a speaker and audience. right? And we should also consider implicit and explicit rule about who is and should be involved, what expectations are established out of this speech act for the participants and who is speaking and who is addressed. So, when we say participants, this is what we mean by it. Moving on to the third element and 
that is ends. So, what is the purpose of this speech event? What is the goal of this speech event? What is the outcome of this speech event? This is what it means when we say ends. Any communicative uh, speech event, any communicative use of language has a defined purpose, a definite goal, right? It entails a definite outcome. So, these goals, these purposes, these outcomes are called ends in this model. So, what ultimately are we talking about? What is, why are we talking about X, right? What is the goal of this interaction or speech event? And what is the ultimate outcome of it? So, this is what we consider when we talk about ends. Uh, moving on, A that stands for act sequence. So, any speech event starts, then proceeds and then ends. So, there is a sequence. So, act sequence in this context refers to form and order of the event. So, act sequence is the sequence of a speech act that makes up the event. The order of a speech act greatly influences the speech event because there is a structure involved in it. There is a structure to speech event. It begins, it proceeds, develops and ends. Right? Act sequence for an event also orients the participants to social cues, inter, you know, interacting, you know, being included in the speech, turn taking, turn, turn giving, right, interjecting, agreeing, disagreeing. So, these are all arranged in a sequence in the speech event. And there are important aspects of act sequence that include turn taking and interrupting. So, it is it talks about interaction and how this interaction moves from beginning to the end. So, this sequence does play a role in achieving the goal and purpose of the speech act. Then the other element is called key. K stands for key. And what is the key? Key refers to the clues that establish the tone, manner or the spirit of a speech act. Clues that establish tone, manner of the speech. So, the tone, the tenor, the delivery, right? they all are crucial in meaning making and they play a crucial role in the speech act. Then next element is instrumentalities. I refers to instrumentalities. And what is that? It refers to the form and the style of a speech. These include the method of communication, right? So, writing, speaking, signaling, whatever. Language or dialect or register. So, they refer to the format and the method how language becomes, how a particular variety becomes instrumental in achieving the goals of that speech event, how that particular dialect becomes instrumental in achieving the goal and objective of that particular speech event. So, I refers to the nature of instrumentality of the language or dialect or register or the code that we are using in the speech act. Then N refers to norms and what is, what is that? Norms refers to the social rules, a negotiated agreed upon social rules that governs the event and the participants action and reaction. Because any speech event happens within a framework of mutually agreed upon negotiated norm set of norms that is sociological in nature, right. So, when it is okay to speech, every this is, this is, there is a cultural variation, each speech community has their own set of norms of interaction, 
right, their own, own shared norms of interaction, the format of interaction. So, something like you know, when it is appropriate to speak, who should listen to what? When is the silence preferred? When you need to be paused, right? What is the tone, tenor? How loudly should you speak? There are cultures where loud speaking is not considered appropriate. So, it all refers to appropriacy of the social norms of interaction and communication and it varies from culture to culture. It varies from speech community to speech community. We cannot have a single universal rule and principle. Uh, what is the speed should be used in conversation? What topics are acceptable? What are the things and the themes that you can discuss in public with anyone? What are the things you cannot discuss like taboo, taboo themes and words? We cannot use, we cannot discuss in certain cultures. So, every culture has a set of taboo themes, taboo words, restricted topics, uh, an identified, negotiated and shared norm of interaction, right. So, norms refers to that community specific, culture specific rules that govern interaction and any speech event, that is norms. And then genre, and what is that? The kind of a speech act or event, what kind of a speech is didactic, you know, narrative in style, moral, moral instruction, gossip, jokes, conversation. So, the type of a speech event, the genre refers to the kind and the type of a speech event. So, if you look at this speaking model by Dalhams, right, this is a response to Chomsky's exclusive linguistic competence, where he delinks a competence from performance. And he says that the linguistic competence is unaffected by the grammatically irrelevant factors like memory, like you know shift in attention and interest and other other in, uh, restrictions that are posed on performance. So, he says that performance cannot reflect in any way the actual competence because the knowledge of language, the underlying structure which is represented in human mind, right, cannot be uh, judged and evaluated in terms of the actual performance. The actual performance of the act need to be delinked from the competence. Competence something that is shared by all ideal speakers are hearers in the homogeneous speech community without variation. This is what it means by universal set of rules of language. But Dalheim's idea that performance cannot be delinked with competence because we do not only learn linguistic structures, but also learn the function of, of them. So, a structure along with their functions, forms along with their functions and these forms and functions are not learned separately and they cannot be delinked. They need to be unified as a single composite unit and this is what we acquire when we acquire language. So, marginalizing the performance was the trigger for Delheims to react to Chomsky's proposal where Chomsky says that the ultimate goal of linguistic theory should be to understand these abstract grammatical structures and their representation in human mind. But Delheims and people like Halliday bringing the socio-cultural context of use of these structures and they say that it cannot be delinked from competence. So, the performance cannot be delinked from the performance, uh, competence cannot be delinked from the performance, they both are acquired. So, the form that we look at in Chomsky's perspective as competence and the function which Chomsky does not talk about, these forms and functions 
together define a language and the goal of any linguistic theory should be an object should be to study this this aspect of language as an object of study right they should be treated as an object of study so they cannot be delinked and he develops a model for in ethnography of communication and he calls it initially it was named as ethnography of speaking later in order to incorporate all the discourse items and elements into it he names it he renames it and creates a acronym uh, an acronym called speaking s p e a k i n g where each letter of this word right represent a discourse element and he says that learning of a language is complete only when you learn the communicative aspect of the language and that's that's why he names it communicative competence and a child learns communicative competence so grammatical that is the form and the use of it that is the function so the form and functions are learned together by the child acquired together by the child or by the learner and this idea of communicative competence has a far fetching consequences and we see a new method of teaching in foreign language develops on this ground that is communicative language teaching and uh, lots of debate and discussions continued afterwards so to chomskyan generative linguistics to chomskyan a uh, mentalist paradigm communicative competence comes as a social linguistic response to it which establishes language as a social reality and grounds it in a socio cultural context so this is what we mean by speaking model which is an ethnographic detailing of the act of communication proposed by dalhams and a new term coined by dalhams called communicative competence so this is it for now and we will further talk on some other responses to chomskyan theory and how social linguistics uh, you know locates language within a socio cultural context thank you